This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we go to part two of our discussion with Professor Tariq Ramadan. President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner visited Saudi Arabia on Tuesday, where he met with Mohammed bin Salman, the new crown prince and defense minister in charge of the ongoing Saudi bombing campaign in Yemen. Kushner also met with the Egyptian president Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt Wednesday, following the U.S. decision to withhold some military funding to Egypt amidst Egypt's deteriorating human rights conditions. Despite withholding some funding, the U.S. continues to give massive military aid to Egypt. Amnesty International said Humvees, small arms, tear gas provided by the U.S. are used to oppress critics of the Egyptian government and facilitate serious human rights violations, like extrajudicial killings, unquote. The White House refused to say exactly where Jared Kushner is going on this Middle East trip, though they're saying he's trying to jumpstart the Middle East peace process. We do know he met with the Jordanian King Abdullah and Amman, the Emir of Qatar in Doha, and that today, on Thursday, he's slated to meet with the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, um, who is under criminal investigation, and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Professor Tark Ramadan, can you talk about what the Trump administration is calling a renewed effort for a peace process. Look, let us be clear on that. That's a joke. It's not going to happen, and it didn't happen before. Even under the Obama administration, there was no peace process, and it's not happening. Even under the Obama administration, what we had is twice over summer the destruction of Gaza and thousands of civilians being killed. And it's as if that's normal, and we have to accept this. The problem is that even when we were talking about, you know, the revolutions and the Arab Spring, uh, we need to, to get the right picture. We are obsessed with the political uh, equation here, talking about democracy, and even Bush told us in 2003, we want to democratize the Middle East. That's not—this is not what is happening. What is happening, and even with the last visit uh, of, you know, the—, the, the um, uh, the son-in-law uh, of the president, is mainly to deal with market and economy and geostrategy. It has nothing to do with solving the political problem, trying to get peace with between Israel and Palestine. That's not the, the main focus here. The main focus, and this is why we were obsessed with the political equation, speaking about democracy, not getting that, in fact, the Arab Spring was the big opportunity to open the market. And which market are we talking about? We are talking here about selling weapons. We are talking about arms selling in the region. Billions of U.S. dollars have been, you know, uh, 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 spent by uh, Gulf states, for example, just with the crisis that we had between Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar. Both countries bought for uh, billions, hundred billion of dollars uh, of weapons from the, the, the Saudi Arabia, and the same on the Qatari side. So you divide the region and you sell weapons to both, and not only to both. You sell weapons knowing, for example, in Saudi Arabia that is going to be used against civilians in a way which has nothing to do with respecting international law. Exactly the same when it comes to, um, to Egypt. Egypt is using U.S. weapons uh, in order to torture people to target civilians, and to have a state which is clearly a dictatorship. And even the Obama administration refused to speak about a coup d'etat, because, in fact, this would have stopped the opportunity for uh, the U.S. government to support financially and military the Egyptian regime. So we have to get the right picture. The hidden uh, story behind all these discussions about peace process that are so is to sell weapons or to buy weapons from Israel, because the only undisputed uh, discussion that we have is, is Israel. Israel can kill innocent people in Gaza, kill civilians, torture people. We don't ask. We don't have the right to ask, even. And we sell the weapons. On the other side, what is happening is we speak about democratizing uh, the Middle East. In fact, the Middle East now, it's completely unsettled. Even with the killing of the civilians in Syria and in Iraq, 
Russia and the United States of America are making money out of it. That's the reality of it. It has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing to do with respecting civil, uh, uh, civilians and rights of the people, or even the Palestinians. We don't care. The point is that sell money, make mo sell weapons, make money, and let them kill one another. At the end of the day, the business is running. Well, Professor Ramadan, on the question of arms sales, of course, these are justified internally uh, in these uh, uh, countries to whom uh, uh, Britain and the U.S. and Russia are selling weapons by saying, well, they have to buy these weapons because they are fighting internal uh, uh, threats from terrorists, from ISIS uh, uh, in Syria and elsewhere to uh, the Taliban uh, uh, in Pakistan. So, so your response to that? No, no, I, I think it's the simplistic, you know, narrative that was uh, sold by the dictators. We had uh, uh, Sadat and after the, before this, after this Mubarak and before and, and after Sisi, who are they are saying, you know what? We, you better deal with us as dictators than with them as crazy people, violent extremists. So let us deal with them. So we sell weapons in order for the government to torture them and to deal with them uh, in the domestic uh, uh, side and also in the regional side. What is the point of us supporting Saudi Arabia killing innocent people in Yemen? Is there something which is 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 uh, it's acceptable? Do, don't they have you know? And and what have we done in Syria uh, until and and uh, for for the first five years when it was still possible to deal with the situation? We don't care as we had the situation in Raqqa now is just the re revealing the whole narrative, the whole way we are dealing. We are targeting civilians. We don't care. So it has nothing to do with uh, supporting you know legitimate governments dealing with terrorists. We are supporting dictators. We are supporting regimes who don't care about their people. But we do this not in the name of human rights. We don't do this in the name of democracy. If we were caring about democracy, let us start with the Gulf states. Let us uh, start with Saudi Arabia. We don't care. We don't ca care about the status of women in the regions. We don't care. What we care is how we're going to protect the geostrategic interests, to protect the security of Israel, and to sell weapons and make money in the region. That's the reality of it. And if this this was to help the countries to go towards more democ dem democracy and, and the democratization process. We should start by uh, not supporting dictators, not supporting a Sisi. In less than 20 minutes, in under Sisi regimes in Egypt, 1,200 people were sentenced to death because they are against the government and we are supporting this. Is this the way we are dealing with human rights? So it's human rights for us and whatever it's acceptable to sell weapons to these dictators, that's not acceptable. And as much, I said it and I repeat this, we want people to take to the street and to say not in our name as Muslims, let us come as Americans, let us come as Europeans and say to our governments, not in our name. You are making money while the people are being killed. We are making money bombarding Syria and when the people are trying to come to Europe, as migrants and refugees, we criminalize them and we let them die in the Mediterranean Sea. Is this, is this right? Is this the way we deal with human rights? I can't accept this. So I would go with the Barcelona, in Barcelona with the Muslims saying, not in my name. And I will go with all the Western people saying, not in our name, because you speak about democracy and you care about money. Well, Professor Ramadan, uh, you've talked about the fact uh, that the U.S. and Britain and Russia are making money off arms sales to Syria, among other countries. But are you suggesting that it's actually in the interests of these countries— And you can add uh, France. —and France, that it's actually in the interests of these countries, France, Britain, the U.S. Yeah. and Russia, to continue uh, uh, the war in Syria and the total dismemberment of, uh, of Iraq only because they're making money off these arms sales? Not only, but they are taking advantage of the situation. Yes, I'm not suggesting. I'm saying it clearly. They are making money out of this situation. The complete and settled situation in the Middle East, it's a big political disaster, and it's an open market to sell weapons and to make money for the time being. And at the same time, not for us not to be uh, focusing on a very central conflict, which has to do with Palestine and Israel. While at the time I'm talking to you, Israel is buying 
weapons and selling technology to the states, to European countries, and even to Arab countries in the region. They are making money while they are still colonizing uh, Palestine. We are talking about a two-state solution. It's over. So when we are told today that the, uh, uh, there is somebody going from, coming from the states, the, the son-in-law of the president coming to start uh, speaking again about uh, uh, the peace process, it's a joke. So I'm not suggesting. I'm saying it clearly. There is uh, uh, a great interest in people fighting one another in the region. The destabilized Middle East is a big market for the Russian, for the Europeans, and, of course, for the U.S., for many reasons. And, once again, we have to be clear about this. But you know what I'm saying is not new. This is an old story. If only we were, uh, and I'm always saying this to, uh, you know, Arabs and, and people in the Middle East, you have to study what happened in Latin America. This is a new, not a new policy. This is known. It's known the way that we are pushing people to fight one another and we are making money and selling uh, weapons to both. In the story between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, this is exactly what happened over the last three months. Uh, Professor Ramadan, but one of the main criticisms uh, uh, of uh, Arab states, uh, so far as the, the Israel-Palestine conflict is, is concerned, is that they actually bear a lot of responsibility for uh, minimally uh, Palestinian refugees, and they themselves turn Palestinians away uh, from their own countries while constantly criticizing uh, Israel for its treatment of Palestinians. Oh, I'm very happy that you are asking this question, and this is a critical question, and you are right. And this has to be said as well. I'm very critical towards the Western policies. I'm critical, of course, of the Israeli policy. But the first to be blamed are the Arab countries, are the Arab governments. In fact, they don't even care about Palestinians. They let them down. And they, they don't want to have problems with them. The policy or the decisions coming from the, the uh, Egypt, for example, towards the Palestinians, it's just outrageous. It's not even acceptable. But all the countries, the Gulf states towards uh, Palestine and Jordan and, and, and even all the other countries, they don't care. So, in fact, we are very often told, you know what, the problem in the Middle East is—the the, the, the reason for all what is happening is uh, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. And I would say, no, that's just revealing a deeper problem that we have with the Arab countries and the Muslim-majority countries in the region. They are the first to be blamed. We cannot accept this, and we have to be very critical. So I'm not saying, because I'm criticizing uh, uh, the US, U.S. government or the European governments, that we have to keep quiet on the, the Gulf states or the Arab countries. They have, and they are the first responsible for what is happening now with the Palestinians. They are even now. You know, look at the Emirates. The Emirates are dealing with Israel. They are dealing with Israel, and they have a, an agreement with Israel, and exactly the same with Egypt. So who are we going to blame? We are going to, say, to let the people to say something about the Palestinians, saying they are lost in, in what is happening now, and even in Syria, they are lost. Who should be blamed for that? The first, it's Bashar al-Assad is a dictator. And what happened also in, in Libya and what, happened in, and what happened in Iraq and all these governments that we have now are not doing the job. So we need something coming from the Middle East. We need more voices within the civil societies in the Middle East being able to address the issue and to be courageous enough to say no to the Arab policies in the region, not in our name as well. And let us create something that could be voices coming from the West, voices coming from the Middle East saying this, that we are going to blame the Arab governments, but also the Western governments, and all the people who are betraying the basic principles we believe in. And this is something that we have to do together. Everything is connected, by the way. And this is why I'm very happy in your program that you are connecting all these things together, because it could be wrong just to look at one uh, picture, one uh, uh, situation and not to connect it to the whole big picture that we are facing. What is happening in the Middle East has to do with what is happening today when it comes to violent extremism. And even, I would say, that anything that has to do with discrimination, it's also coming out of this big and great narrative that is imposed onto us, uh, normalizing the way we are targeting some people and saving the life of others. It has to do with Arabs, it has to do with Muslims, it has to do with black people. It's exactly the same logic. Let us understand this, because this is why we can come together and say no to these policies coming from the Arab world as well as from the West.
Professor Ramadan, <clears throat> as we speak, uh, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, um, uh, is making the rounds of the Middle East in an effort to uh, resume the so-called peace process. On Tuesday, he was in Saudi Arabia, meeting with his personal friend, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince who's in charge of the um, destruction, the bombing campaign of Yemen. The next day in Yemen, a U.S.-backed Saudi-led airstrike north of Sana'a killed at least 41 people when it struck a hotel. Uh, President Trump, his first foreign trip um, as president of the United States, was to, in a break with all tradition, Saudi Arabia. Though visiting Saudi Arabia on the part of a president wasn't a break with tradition, President Obama visited Saudi Arabia a number of times. Can you assess the Trump administration at this point? Um, your assessment of President Trump, uh, when you look at him from across the pond, from afar, um, in the Middle East, and here at home, in the U.S.? I think there are two things. When it comes to what you were saying about Saudi Arabia, once again, they don't care about democracy, they don't care about human rights, they don't they care about interest in the region. And now, when Salman is clearly an ally. The, the Saudis and the Saudi government was, of course, before in the light of the, the, the U.S. policy in the region. Now it's quite clear. Sell the weapons and try to get uh, an understanding of how we are going to deal with uh, with uh, with the, the Saudi government supporting and protecting the interest or the U.S. interest in the region. That's all what uh, Trump is doing. But by the way, let me be clear, it was exactly the same with Obama and exactly the same with Bush before. So it's a continuous. Whatever is the government or the president, it's always the same. Now, let me be, say something about this. I am a, a, a Western Muslim, and I'm trying to get a, a deep understanding of Islam and helping us to live as Muslims in our societies today, and democratic society. Who are we supporting in Saudi Arabia? The Salafi? And the Salafi might not be violent, but they are supporting an interpretation of Islam, which is us versus them very literalist, very, very narrow-minded. They don't want us to deal, and they want us to think that the West is the, the enemy. So, so you are supporting a government that is just protecting your interests, but at the same time promoting an ideology which is completely based on us versus them. So are you supporting a version or an interpretation of Islam, which is exactly the opposite of what you are asking the Muslims to say at the same time? It's a contradiction in term. What is this? So how could you support this? How could you support a government saying there is no democracy in Islam? Women cannot drive. It's just a, 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 a very literalist understanding of Islam. And, and they are killing people. They are imposing a way of understanding Sharia, which is always only based on punishing the victims. And the victims are poor people and women in the country, not the princes, not the kings, just the poor people. And this is uh, what Trump is doing now, following in the footsteps of all the policies that we had coming from the U.S. And then at the same time, domestically, what he said, be clear on this, the narrative, what, what, it was not by accident that Trump said about Muslims, we want to ban Muslims on Muslims coming from Muslim-majority countries. In fact, the connection between violent extremism and Muslim and Muslim being a problem is exactly the same narrative. And I would say that what he said about Charleston, it's exactly the same. At one point, we need to get it clear. The whole narrative about black people in the United States of America is normalizing a state of structural racism. And we say, oh, we target, you know, the people who are dealing with drugs and, 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 and criminals. But at the same time, we are creating suspicions towards black people and suspicions towards the Muslims and suspicions towards the Latinos. So there is something here where uh, uh, it's not new. This is a very old story. But we need to get it from within and to understand that the question is not about only the facts. The question has to do with the narrative that is imposed and this political discourse that we have and what is done by the Trump administration in the Middle East is exactly the opposite of what we should promote when it comes to human rights and the right interpretation of Islam, the open interpretation of Islam. We are serious about Islam, but Islam, it's an open religion dealing with common principles that we have. It's not the literalist version and interpretation coming from the Salafi supported by the United States of America. If you want to give a bad image of Islam, support the Saudi, support the Gulf states. And this is what the United States and the European countries are doing.
together. Professor Ramadan, you were banned from the United States for six years. Um, are you allowed in the United States under President Trump? So far, I am. I was there a uh, few months ago, two or three months ago, and I will be coming back. I have a new book coming, uh, An Introduction to Islam, where I'm, I'm talking about all the things in the book to come, so I will have a, a, a visit in September. We'll see. So far, so good. It's, it, it's okay, and I hope it's not going to. But, you know, at the end, if I am banned from the United States because of what I'm, 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 I'm saying now, it's just revealing uh, the state of affairs within the country. It's worrying. So, Professor Ramadan, can you go from, you, well, your own ban here in the U.S. and how it affected you to, well, jump forward to President Trump and the Muslim ban, in this case, uh, a ban on uh, immigrants coming in from six majority Muslim countries? Yes, I, I think my situation was solved uh, uh, in 2010. Uh, and that's fine. I can come, and, and I'm privileged in a way because I didn't have to go through all these problems that you have uh, with Muslims coming from the six Muslim majority countries. Uh, we 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 need to to get once again the big picture. At the beginning, it was nine countries, and it sent. Uh, even the, the fact that we are talking about the Muslim ban is just, once again, it's making Islam the problem and, and the Muslim majority countries, and to target some of some of these countries when not targeted, of course, because they are allies. So so when you are supporting the Salafi, you but still you have money. At the end of the day, the countries with uh, which we are trading and making money, they are not to be banned, and, and we are uh, putting some uh, uh, suspicion on others. So it's all political, and it's using Islam as a way of uh, spreading around a very bad and negative perception of Islam. So I think that this is pure discrimination, stigmatization, and it is very dangerous. And the, 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 the rational and the narrative and, and, and all what uh, uh, Trump has been uh, saying during the campaign before he was president and afterward is just nurturing the sense that uh, it's, we are not only talking about the violent extremists as a problem. We are talking about Islam and the Muslim majority countries as a problem. Uh, and he's ready to deal with government. He's ready to deal with dictators uh, as long as the interests are protected. But uh, what it gives as an impression within the states and uh, at the domestic, and and it's it opens in a way uh, a way for racists and white supremacists uh, um, uh, in a way in another because some of them are connecting black people, Muslims, Arabs, Latinos, strangers, foreigners. All this is all the same at the end of the day. The white supremacists are are, are, are picturing the whole thing in the in 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 that way, us versus them. And uh, Trump is nurturing this uh, sense of uh, uh, division within the society. And this is very dangerous. And it's not only dangerous for Muslims. The Muslim ban is not dangerous for Muslims. It's dangerous for the unity uh, of the American society. It's uh, the very essence of a, di uh, a society based on diversity and migrations and taking its uh, strength from or getting its strength from this diversity. He is putting this at risk with this uh, political discourse that we have today. And we need to stand up and to come together. And I am, you know, uh, what is coming from the feminist uh, 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 discourse uh, about intersectionality, we need to look at this, because at one point, all this is connected, and, and the struggle of uh, uh, American Muslims is the same as black Americans, is the same as women being uh, stigmatized. At one point, behind this, there is a narrative which is very problematic, and Islam today is part of this, at the domestic level as well as at the international level. Well, Professor Ramadan, uh, uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, is that, of course, uh, even when this Muslim ban was first enunciated, it did not include um, allies uh, of the U.S., most notably uh, Saudi Arabia. And yeah. you've talked about how Saudi Arabia propagates a very particular uh, uh, form of Islam, the, the Salafi uh, uh, tradition, and its effects uh, on the region. Can you talk about what the strain of uh, a very strict interpretation of Islam suggests, and also um, the way in which uh, the Saudi regime and many other uh, regimes in the, in the Arab world and Muslim world treat their minorities, in particular uh, uh, the Shia community. 
Yeah, that, that's very important. And I, I would say if we want to summarize three main features of the Salafi, the first one uh, is literalism, is that there is no room for interpretation, no way to deal with contemporary issues, a very, very backward interpretation uh, of Islam when it comes to uh, uh, societies, when it comes to democracy, when it comes to human rights, when it comes even to uh, punishment and the way they are understanding Sharia. It's a very narrow understanding, which means we punish first and we reform after, which is completely wrong. This is a very dangerous interpretation. So we have this. Within and among uh, uh, Muslims, even among the Sunni, th this perception that it's us versus them, we have the only right interpretation of Islam and all the others are uh, alienated Muslims and, and, and even not Muslims. For some of the people who are supporting Saudi Arabia, I'm not even a Muslim. I'm not even a Muslim. I'm a kafir murtad. Murtad means uh, apostate, and kafir means an infidel. So I, my blood is considered as lawful by some of the scholars who are supporting the Saudi regime, which, you know, I'm banned from Saudi Arabia uh, for things that I have been saying about the, 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 the country and the government. So this is within among the Muslims is this is the only right interpretation, all the others are wrong. And then add to this the fact that they are now nurturing this narrative that Islam is about the, the Sunni and the Shia are no longer Muslim. So they are the enemy. And the point is that this is not only the discussion between Saudi Arabia and Iran, it's everywhere within the narrative that we have. It's the most dangerous people for the Muslims, meaning the Sunni, are the Shia. And the way they are targeting is, is, is in fact, by uh, uh, targeting them, uh, uh, explaining their policies towards the Shia at the international level based on these people are not really Muslims and they are dangerous because they are distorting Islam from within to the point that you come with the way they are dealing with minorities within the, the, the country. You remember when we were talking about the Arab Spring, the people were very happy with what was happening in Tunisia, what was happening in Egypt, and we were silent about what was going, uh, what was happening in Bahrain. And in Bahrain, what we got coming from the coverage, even from Al Jazeera and Qatar was, oh, these people are Shi'i and they are against the Sunni government. How come you are saying this? How come you can justify the fact that you are killing people protesting against a, 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 a regime and dictatorship just by saying that they are Shia? So it's legitimized. It's, it's right to kill Shia people because they are Shia. And look at what is happening in Yemen. It's exactly the same narrative. It's exactly the same rationale that we have here. So, uh, yes, this is this ideology is based on this. It's... Uh, uh, based on literalism, based on internal divisions, being the only right interpretation of Islam and targeting the Shia, add to this, that they are telling us that we should not be involved in politics. So if you go to the street in Saudi Arabia and to say that's a corrupt government, uh, the Mufti is going to tell you, oh, no, this is un-Islamic. So this is also what they were saying in Egypt. It's un-Islamic to, to, to take to the street because this is wrong from an Islamic perspective. So once again, it's a very, very uh, a smart way of instrumentalizing religion to support the worst uh, dictatorships uh, in the world. And who is supporting these people? For the sake of what? Who is supporting them? All the European governments and, all, and the United States of America. Why? Because for two reasons. It's, yes, for money, because they have money and they have oil and they have gas. That's one thing. But it's more cynical than that even, that their interpretation of Islam is very interesting for political reasons at the domestic level and in, at the international level. You support these people, and in fact, they are very much more welcome in the West than I am. So I'm told, be open promote citizenship, but when you come to this, you are suspected, but when you come with a very literalist way of dealing with Islam, you're welcome. Why? Because there is an, a, an ideological game. In fact, what is expected from Muslims is perceived within the society as dangerous if we speak about citizenship, equal rights, human rights, and we are ready for it. And I'm ready for it. I'm ready to, to, to be critical towards the, the, the Gulf states and, and Saudi Arabia and others, even Iran. I, I went there and I said, your policy, I cannot support. We are ready for that. But it's very strange and cynical that even our governments look at us as dangerous. To be banned from the United States of America as I was banned from France for, for almost a year, 
Why? Why are you banning us when we say things that you don't like? So at the end of the day, you like what? Their version of Islam? Or do you want us to be serious about being Muslim and at the same time being Democrats? Professor Ramadan, very quickly, I wanted to get your response to President Trump's speech on Monday, uh, where he talked about uh, increasing the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan by something like 4,000. And he also, well, let me play the clip. I have already lifted restrictions the previous administration placed on our warfighters that prevented the Secretary of Defense and our commanders in the field from fully and swiftly waging battle against the enemy. Micromanagement from Washington, D.C. does not win battles. They are one in the field, drawing upon the judgment and expertise of wartime commanders and frontline soldiers acting in real time with real authority and with a clear mission to defeat the enemy. That's why we will also expand authority for American Armed Forces to target the terrorist and criminal networks that sow violence and chaos throughout Afghanistan. These killers need to know they have nowhere to hide, that no place is beyond the reach of American might and American arms. Retribution will be fast and powerful. As we lift restrictions and expand authorities in the field, we are already seeing dramatic results in the campaign to defeat ISIS, including the liberation of Mosul in Iraq. We only have a minute, Professor Ramadan. Your response to President Trump. Yeah. Hmm. No, I think that, once again, we are talking about liberation of Mosul, and we are talking about, you know, supporting the Afghani people. We never supported the Afghani people for, for their own sake, but because, once again, it's a geostrategic uh, area, and there is gas, and there is uranium, and there is lithium in the region, and that's, once again, why we want to remain there and to support is for economic reasons, not for democracy. It's exactly the same in Syria, so we are talking about liberation, but, once again, let us come to what you said at the beginning of the program, facts and figures are showing that we don't care about killing civilians, and Arab civilians have less values than American civilians in the Trump's narrative, and that's unacceptable. Professor Ramadan, we want to thank you for being with us. Professor Tarek Ramadan, professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford thank University. You. His latest book, Islam. Professor Ramadan was named by Time magazine as one of the most important innovators of the 21st century. To see part one of our discussion with Professor Tariq Ramadan, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.